Any woman with endometriosis must realize it's only going to get worse. The earlier that it's diagnosed, the more likely it is it's going to get bad by the time they want to have a family. It's very important that doctors refer patients with early endometriosis who don't have children and all want to have more children to people like us to extract their eggs and freeze them for them for future dispensation. Because time waits for no one. And if you do nothing about it, by the time they get to 35, they may not have as many eggs left and they waste an inordinate amount of time and unfortunately also waste a lot of money in the process of doing what is not going to work in the first place. And I think far bigger than the waste of time and money is the waste of emotion. People often forget how emotionally charged infertility is. And to put someone on a course which is not going to benefit their objective, their end point objective, in my opinion, is not good medicine. Welcome to the Egg Whisperer Show. I'm thrilled to have famed fertility doctor, Dr. Jeffrey Scher on today's show again. Thank you, Jeff, for joining us again. Pleasure. If you're not familiar with Dr. Scher, he is co-founder of Share Fertility Solutions, SFS, and is an internationally renowned expert in the field of assisted reproductive technology and has been influential in the births of more than 17,000 IVF babies. Over the last 30 years, he has helped fashion the entire field of ART. After training under the fathers of IVF, Dr. Patrick Steptoe and Robert Edwards, he established the first private IVF program in the United States in 1982. He later expanded his practice to include a number of centers throughout California before founding the first FSS based in Las Vegas and in New York. And he's an author of several books, and he's going to tell us about one of the most recent books that he wrote that's going to be coming out soon. Welcome, Jeff. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. So we're going to talk about a rational basis for treating endometriosis-related infertility. First, what is rational about treating endometriosis-related infertility? First of all, endometriosis is a condition that cannot be cured. And whether or not you treat it medically or surgically to get rid of the lesions, which goes to the definition of the condition, which is basically the deposition of endometrial lesions outside the uterus and the pelvic cavity and beyond. But the treatment of those lesions surgically or even medically does not solve the problem of infertility because there are causes, there are factors that these lesions evoke that perpetuate and they're there forever. A woman never gets rid of endometriosis. You can alleviate symptoms, you can reduce the impact of it by removing some of those lesions but you're not going to get rid of those that are still coming up and they keep on coming up. It's a work in progress. So people need to understand that endometriosis has to be managed and the treatment options we offer simply improve the chances of fertility without getting rid of the actual underlying condition. And what do patients need to know about it if they suspect they have it? How do they talk to their doctor about it? It first requires an understanding about what the genesis is of endometriosis. Now, there are many, many theories on how endometriotic nodules and deposits appear in the pelvis. The most popular of those theories or those explanations is that there's a condition called retrograde menstruation. That when a woman menstruates, she actually doesn't only menstruate outwardly, but if she's even got one fallopian tube that's open, the blood will pass through the tube and spill out of the finger-like projections the end of the tube into the pelvis, drip over the ovaries and mix in with pelvic secretions. Now this happens in all women that have got open tubes intermittently and more frequently in some. This blood contains live cells of the endometrium and these cells have a predilection for growing on the surface of the membranous envelopment of all the pelvic organs known as the peritoneum. They grow there very readily and they grow in all women because this process occurs in all women. In other words, in all women, cells from the endometrium will grow on the peritoneal surface. But the moment the woman ovulates, she starts to produce progesterone and that signals her immune system 
the janitorial system of the body, of the pelvis, which sends down cells that rush to the area through the, the peritoneal membranes, little pores in it. And these cells engulf and destroy these deposits, remove them, much like the old fashioned game called Pac Man, just gobble up all the interventional cells. And then by the time the next period begins, the room is tidy, all the deposits are gone, and the process starts again. Now, in some women, and this is again a little bit of interjecting my own belief here, but in some women, there is some suppression of this immune clearance mechanism. So these cells perpetuate and continue to grow. And as they grow, they grow thicker and thicker because they are basically endometrial tissue. When the woman menstruates, she menstruates into the tissue. And of course, blood contains red stuff called hemoglobin. And the hemoglobin is mainly an iron compound. And then after the, when the period comes, she will end up bleeding into these deposits at a certain point. And when it gets so severe, the thickness is so severe that bleeding appears into these deposits. It leaves behind a telltale sign of the pigment, the iron pigment called hemosiderin in these deposits, which then when you do a laparoscopy or you open the abdomen and look inside, it will look like little pigeon eyes looking at you or it will look like gunpowder. And then the doctor turns around and says to the patient, you've got endometriosis, ignoring the fact that she had this for years before, but it didn't present itself that it's visible. Now, these little lesions can become confluent. They can grow. They can eventually bleed more and more. And if it occurs in the ovary, blood collects in it. We call that an endometrioma. And this blood then decomposes and that's what we call the cysts that form from these endometriotic deposits, chocolate cysts, because it looks like molten chocolate. And so the genesis of endometriosis is very important because for every little spot you see, and presumably you remove surgically, there are probably another 20, 30 or more that are growing. So it keeps on replenishing. And what you remove doesn't get rid of those you can't see, which is the majority. And for that reason, endometriosis is something that you develop from a relatively early age, but only becomes manifest, usually in the second half of a woman's reproductive lifespan. The deposits themselves release toxins that are released into the secretions of the pelvis. These toxins are like little piranha fish in a river. The egg leaves the ovary, it's got to cross the river, to get into the tube where the sperm is waiting to fertilize it. And the toxins attach to little receptors on the egg called ZP receptors where the sperm attaches and they blockade it, make it more difficult for sperm to enter into the egg. As a consequence, the ability of a woman to get pregnant is reduced dramatically, perhaps five or six fold per month of trying. And that is present even before you can see the lesions visible. The woman that has the propensity to develop this ongoing process, they will have the reduced fecundity, which expresses the ability to get pregnant without the trying. They will present with this reduced fecundity. And there's nothing you or I or anybody else can do to change that. If you get rid of the lesions, you don't get rid of the other lesions coming up, and they are also producing these toxins, which is why endometriosis is so common as a cause of infertility. In fact, 25 to 40 percent of all infertility is in one way or another linked to endometriosis, and it occurs in 10 percent of all women. It's very important to understand this, because now you better understand that, or the listener will better understand, that if you give a woman fertility drugs to make her release more eggs, the eggs still have to cross over this river full of piranha fish to get to the other bank. And as a consequence, very few of them are going to arrive there in a condition to make a, a journey into the interior. So the woman's ability to conceive is not improved through using fertility drugs, nor is it improved by surgically getting rid through laser ablation of these lesions. 
the only way you can improve the chance of a woman getting pregnant is really to get the eggs out before they release to that environment, fertilize them, and put them in the woman's uterus through IVF. Just before I let you take over here, I'm not suggesting all women with endometriosis need IVF. They can still get pregnant if they've got the time, if they're young enough, and if they've got normal ovarian reserve and lots of eggs. But for women over 35, and women who don't have ovarian reserve that's normal, they simply don't have the time to waste for a 2 to 3% chance of conceiving per month of trying with or without surgery. So whether you do surgery, whether you do intrauterine insemination, whether you give fertility drugs, the chance of conception when women with endometriosis, even in its mildest form, is no better than no treatment at all. You may alleviate symptoms. The only time surgery is indicated is if it's causing, if there's an endometrioma, which we spoke about earlier in the ovary, and you've got to remove it, or if there are dense adhesions that are preventing the tube from functioning in younger women, but not in women that are older or don't have much time left. And then how do you diagnose endometriosis? It can only really be diagnosed definitively by doing an laparoscopy or in making an incision in the abdomen and seeing these little powder bones, gun powder bones, or little pigeon eyes looking at you. Or if you see in the ovary a chocolate cyst, which is an endometrioma, which is easily identifiable, through ultrasound, that will give you a diagnosis, or you could use certain newer tests that have come up, like the BCL6 test, where you do a biopsy of the endometrium and you look for the integrins, and you try to see if the woman's got this propensity, but it's not definitive, and it can also be positive with other forms, including hydrosalpics and other tubal disease, but if you see that a woman has increased BCL6 level, about 1.4 or 5, then you know that the likelihood is that there's underlying endometriosis. But the definitive diagnosis is only determined through visualization of the lesions. And do you have any favorite IVF protocols that you use for patients if you know they have endometriosis? Not really, because the, as long as there is not an endometrioma in the ovary, I'd like to make this point because when you do IVF for endometriosis, you've got to first be sure that in either of the ovaries, there's not an endometrioma that is larger than, say, a one and a half centimeters, because these endometriomas act like what we call space-occupying lesions or misfit tumors. They irritate the surrounding tissue in the ovary, causing overproduction of the male hormone testosterone, which is an essential contribution to get to egg production and follicle growth because it's the building block for which estrogen is formed. But if there's too much testosterone produced in the ovary, it gets into the fluid of the follicle and it interferes with egg development. And then when you trigger the woman, the egg in the ovary with the endometrioma is far more likely to be chromosomally abnormal. We looked at this by doing egg retrievals on women with endometriomas. And we removed the eggs from a woman with an endometrioma on that side, and then compared it with the quality of the eggs on the other side, and there's a definitive difference. So for anybody that tells you if there's endometrioma in the ovary, oh, we just ignore it and leave it alone, that's the wrong advice. You want to get rid of the endometrioma to improve the ability of the eggs in the affected ovary to improve the natural wires laparoscopically treating the endometrioma or doing sclerotherapy. So I think what you're saying, in women who have endometriomas, they should be at least counseled about the benefit of surgery and be told that they might have lower egg quality, lower number of blastocysts, and if they get blastocysts, there's a higher rate that they could be genetically abnormal. Is that right? That is absolutely correct. It's important to make people understand that it's the affected ovary. And you usually find that the one with the endometrioma in it is the one that produces bad eggs, and it's the egg and not the sperm that is primarily responsible for the chromosome integrity of the embryo. So therefore, the egg, the ovary unaffected, that does not have the endometrioma in it, will still be able to produce good eggs, while the other one won't, and we've shown this. When you're making a fertility plan with a patient, and you know that they have endometriosis, 
How many cycles? This is a question I get all the time. Do you tell them that they need more embryos than let's say someone else that doesn't have endometriosis to reach their family size goals or at the outset tell them they might need more cycles from the beginning? I don't think that the presence of mild endometriosis in the pelvis or even moderately severe will affect equality. I think if it's an ovary affected by an endometrioma or if it's a consequence of advanced endometriosis, the blood supply to the ovary is compromised such that the ovary then starts going into failure and you end up with diminished ovarian reserve, which is a consequence of advanced endometriosis. Then you've got a problem and you've got to deal with it like you deal with diminished ovarian reserve, be a little bit more aggressive and stimulate in a specific way to protect the, the follicles and the eggs from being corrupted through overexposure to testosterone produced by the ovary. When you have a patient who's preparing for their IVF cycle and you know they have endometriosis, is there a special diet or supplement regimen or exercise regimen that you ask them to follow? Not really. I don't think, to my knowledge at least, I don't believe there's any supplements that directly impact on the egg quality. I know all sorts of things have been suggested. DHEA, PRP of the ovary. To me, those are that's where no it. I don't believe there's any real evidence that that does anything. We offer it to patients who absolutely insist upon it, but explain to them that in my opinion, it really is window dressing. The big issue is to get the eggs out before you run out of them, which will happen with advanced endometriosis, to treat the ovary affected by endometriomas, to make sure that that ovary isn't compromised, and you then give eight to 12 weeks of a break to allow the ovary to recover before doing another egg recruitment. But I don't think that there's any evidence whatsoever that any of these drugs or approaches really impact on egg quality. And what I would love to get into more is about endometriosis impact on implantation and what your favorite transfer protocols are or your approach when it comes to that. We've been through this in previous discussions. What we have found unequivocally is that one third of women who have endometriosis Again, regardless of its severity, and even women that are in the preclinical phase of endometriosis, where you cannot see any lesions, they're in the process of evolving, will have an increased risk of an immunologic implantation dysfunction, where immune cells in the uterine lining called natural killer cells become activated and overproduce what we call Th1 cytokines that attack the embryo, the root system, the trophoblast and destroy the embryo or damage the roots. So the woman loses the pregnancy before she knows she's pregnant or she gets pregnant and then run, the embryo runs out of steam and she has a chemical pregnancy or a miscarriage. So the immunologic side is a form of autoimmune implantation dysfunction. Because as I described earlier on, women with endometriosis have a dumbed down immunologic response that leads to the problem in the first place, as I explained earlier on. So in women with endometriosis, you've got to be aware that regardless of severity, you could have an immunologic problem if you don't address that. In my opinion, at least, a woman who keeps spinning her wheels over and over with good embryos and not see the light of day and have a pregnancy that's viable. Yeah. And then what about the role of Depo, Lupron, or Lissa in your practice? Do you use that when you're preparing someone for an embryo transfer? I do not personally use, uh, firstly, the, ag the agonists that people give, such as Lupron or Decapeptil or Superfact. I don't use it because I, there's a reason. If you give a woman Depo Lupron, you're going to end up suppressing estrogen production in the ovary. And for the uterine lining to respond adequately to estrogen, the receptors have to be attuned. If you starve the endometrium of estrogen, you'll end up with the uterine lining being unable to respond optimally to estrogen and you end up with an endometrial lining issue. I'm not a big fan of using Depolupron or Depoprogesterone. Now, it's a different matter if you're using it for symptomatic relief or symptomatic treatment of endometriosis. But I don't think it really adds anything to the equation. There are others that disagree, and I'm not always right, as my wife often reminds me. But the truth of the matter is, one has to accept that you're really not going to do much 
to improve the quality of the eggs and the ovaries production. When you stop the depolutron, it comes back when it's four weeks. You're back where you started again. So I'm not a big believer in it. Again, it's never the doctor's right to tell people what to do. It's our responsibility to keep information so they can make their own choices and then to execute based on those choices. So I'm never going to tell a patient who says, I want to use something to suppress the endometriosis for a few months, but I'll warn her and say, you're wasting a few months. And when you come back, we're in the same position, because ultimately we're going to remove your eggs. We're going to fertilize them and likely test the embryos to PGT and freeze them and come back a few months later to put the embryos back. In my opinion, you will, your ovaries, your uterus will recover in a few months. But I don't think there's any advantage in terms of egg collection, egg numbers and quality through using those approaches. Yeah, I agree. Using them first can be extremely detrimental. I definitely believe that too. I just want to emphasize, I'm the guy that introduced IUY into the field of medicine. Very proudly so, and I believe it has a place. But it doesn't improve the chances of a woman with endometriosis having a baby because you're not going to impact the toxic environment in the pelvic cavity through which the egg must pass to reach the tube where the sperm's waiting. So you can do IUI and you may get pregnant while doing it. But in my opinion, you're getting pregnant in spite of it, not due to it. That doesn't mean you never use fertility drugs for IUI, because some women aren't ovulating and they're not ovulating normally. And if they're not ovulating, ovulating normally, you can use these medications. But then you need to bear in mind that you're not getting a woman above the two to 5% chance of a pregnancy that she would have had had she had the same condition with normal, regular, spontaneous ovulation. So I don't believe the use of fertility drugs or surgery to get rid of small lesions in the pelvis, other than removing endometriomas and freeing dense adhesions has any benefits in improving outcome with endometriosis. I tell women that are under 35 and still ovulating normally with regular and normal ovarian reserve that they can certainly wait. But rather than spend your money on me to be able to give you treatment which is not benefiting you, why don't you try to ovulate your kind intercourse based upon ovulation reduction take some ovulation support or even medication to make you ovulate if you're not, and try to get pregnant if you want to on your own. But if you want to do something to improve your chances of having a baby, alas, the only thing that'll do it is IVF, which becomes more of an imperative. The older the woman we get becomes as the egg quality declines through wear and tear over time, and if she's got diminished reserve and fewer eggs, depleting her egg population, she doesn't have the time to waste on doing things that are going to give her a two to five percent chance of pregnancy, but she doesn't have the kind of time to waste. So in my opinion, IVF is the only definitive treatment for infertility with endometriosis, while all other measures are temporizing measures and completely acceptable given different circumstances, but not if the person's going to believe that what they're doing really improves their chance to marry the baby. That would be the most important message that I could impart, at least it's my opinion. And I couldn't agree more with you. I mean, I feel like endometriosis is definitely a fertility threatening condition and women who are diagnosed with it, especially when they're like teenagers, whoever's making that diagnosis should also encourage them to freeze their eggs. You know, don't wait, freeze your eggs. If you've had surgery for endometriosis when you were 20, the next thing you should do, or even before surgery is freeze your eggs. And I'm also pretty passionate about requiring, and I wish I could do this, that every OBGYN or endometriosis surgeon out there, a lot of them are pretty good about this. Before you do surgery on a patient with endometriosis, it should be a requirement to talk to that patient about her fertility. So at least she's educated about it. I applaud you. That's an excellent point. That is probably the most important point that has been made in this entire presentation. I should launch to it. And that is that any woman with endometriosis must realize it's only going to get worse. The earlier that it's diagnosed, the more likely it is it's going to get bad by the time they want to have a family. It's very important that doctors refer patients with early endometriosis who don't have children 
and all want to have more children, two people like us, to extract their eggs and freeze them for them for future dispensation, because time waits for no one. And if you do nothing about it, by the time they with still with that two to five percent chance on their own of getting pregnant, by the time they get to 35, they may have lost a lot of their ovarian reserve, they may not have as many eggs left, and they've wasted an inordinate amount of time and unfortunately also wasted a lot of money in the process of doing what is not going to work in the first place. And I think far bigger than the waste of time and money is the waste of emotion. People often forget how emotionally charged infertility is. And to put someone on a course which is not going to benefit their objective, their endpoint objective, in my opinion, is not good medicine. So I agree with you and I applaud that statement. All doctors who find endometriosis in young women should at least talk to them about infertility or refer them to people like us where we can talk to them and explain these realities to them so they can prepare themselves and avoid the disaster that will follow. And please don't believe people who tell you, I'll go in and do a laparoscopy and I'll zap the endometriotic deposits and then you're going to be fine because for every lesion they zap and remove, there's probably another 20 or 30 coming up already doing their disaster. The bottom line is you're not improving your chances by just doing surgery or doing fertility drugs or IUI unless you've got the ovulation problem that you're treating in the hope of getting pregnant on your own before you get too old or before you run out of eggs. And there's something else that I've been also telling my patients who have endometriosis probably in the last five years or so. I've been reminding them about the connection between endometriosis and ovarian cancer. I think it's good because endometroid cancer can occur in women with endometriosis. And yes, it, the doctor's got to be on the lookout for it and do whatever testing is necessary. Unfortunately, as you know, ovarian cancer is not easy to diagnose, but you've got to be on the lookout for it. And oftentimes, doing paracentesis, flushing of the colosac and then taking the fluid to look for ovarian cancer cells is a way to go. But I agree with you. Patients need to be aware that endometroid ovarian cancer is actually something that you need to be on the lookout for. Jeff, thank you for the wisdom that you shared with us today. I will never forget the piranha cells, the janitor cells, the Pathman cells, <laughs> the misfit tumor. I mean, like, love it all. And I'll be using them. But tell us what you're up to lately. I just want people to know that there is a book that they can get free as a download or they can read online that I've just written with my partner in New York, Dr. Tortorella. This book is called From In Vitro Fertilization to Family. I'll hold it up over here so people can see it. It's like an operational manual. It's about 180 pages long and goes into every aspect of the IVF experience, at least from our perspective, is what we think need to be considered. There's a whole chapter in there on endometriosis and infertility as well, and on, on immunology and infertility. It'll be out probably uh, through Amazon within two or three months. But in the meanwhile, anybody interested in the book can call my assistant, Patty, at 702-533-2691, or can go to Patty on her email, it's called concierge, C-O-N-C-I-E-R-G-E, -E, at sureivf.com, and ask her to send you the link. Then you'll be able to look at these, uh, this particular book. And I think it will be helpful to you, and you should take advantage of that. I agree. All the books that you've written, my patients have really enjoyed reading. And, you know, like I said earlier, your shows have always been the had the highest downloads, especially our episode, How to Avoid Implantation Failure During IVF. And I think this episode will also be very helpful for women who are suffering with infertility, especially those with endometriosis. So Jeff, real quick, before we end our show today, where can patients find you if they want to work with you as their fertility doctor? Well, firstly, let me explain something that's really important. I do consultations out of my home base in Las Vegas. I don't do procedures here. When I do procedures, I've just come back from doing a bundle in New York at our clinic in Midtown, Manhattan. My patients come there for a week. I do their egg retrieval. We do the testing. They come back from frozen transfers. 
as needed. But when they got a doctor like you, they don't need me, Amy. You are the best. And I often tell my patients, if I had a, if my daughter lived in your area and needed IVF, there's only one place I'd send her, and that would be to you. And that's really a feather in your cap, because I don't say that often. But the truth of the matter is, if anybody needs me for a second opinion, I will always send them back to the doctor they came from, as you know it. And in addition, if they want me for some reason to be the one treating them, I and my partner, Dr. Triello, who wrote this book together, thereby indicating that we do things the same way, will be happy to help you. And the consultation is done by you calling the same number I gave you, my assistant, Patty, and also the email address that I gave her, or going to my website, www.shareidf.com, and making an appointment there to see me or to talk with me. And we'll have an online consultation and I'll be able to give you my best advice. And you certainly do. And I send so many patients to you for those second opinions. And we greatly appreciate the advice that you've given them. It's always a pleasure. Really. Thank you, Jeff. I hope you'll come back on again soon and we'll talk about more topics and I'll just continue to learn more from you. Thank you so much. Very kind.